All right, friends, welcome to the Thrive Forward podcast today. It is our last episode of 2021. I can't believe that we have made it this far. I'm so grateful to you as a listener of the Thrive Forward. Make sure that you're subscribing to the podcast so that you get our weekly download of information right to your phone or listening device. That being said, on today's episode of the Thrive Forward podcast, we're going to kind of round out some of the themes financially for the year of 2021. Now, uh, of course, we we can't say that anything that's happened in the past is indicative of what's going to happen in the future. But I want to talk to you about some of the things that have happened this year and maybe how they will impact you going forward into 2022 and beyond. So press play if you know somebody that would provide a great amount of impact to their lives by listening to this episode please share always take us in social media when you share our episode we love to see that you are doing that and it is so important that we continue to allow others to thrive forward as well so let's talk Well, friends, we thought COVID-19 was only going to be for a period of time in 2022 and it would leave us behind as the new year switched over and our clocks changed to 2021. And the reality is, as we switch our clocks over to 2022, we are still battling with the impacts, especially financially, of COVID-19. That being said, I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the themes that happened with the virus. And I want to remind you, as we sometimes feel uncomfortable about what's happening financially as a country, as a world, we do live in a very global economy. So that does mean we are impacted by the economies that happen across the world and what happens in one place affects us in another. So what can we look at going forward into 2022, why should we be concerned about some of these big economic and financial issues and how do they impact us personally? So COVID-19 in 2020, when it first hit the shores of the U.S., we all closed our doors and were under lockdown for a good amount of period of time. That meant that a lot of places weren't functioning in their full business capacity. Not every company could function on Zoom as I record this or from their home office. Not everyone could create the pivot plan. That being said, we are still impacted today, almost 18, 24 months later. What are some of those impacts? Well, if you are a business owner and someone that produces or manufactures a product, you know that it has been really hard. There's these two little words, my friends, and sometimes they're joined by a hyphen in between. So maybe it's one word, supply chain. Supply chain is something that is the element of one piece of a product or one element of a product that is being delivered to the person that needs it, right? How does product B get to to get to the place that it needs to be? And like, that's the simplest of terms. Really, it's just how do pieces get to us? For example, we've seen a huge chip shortage. And, um, you know, those little electronic devices that we love to have, our phones, our cars, the navigation in our cars, the heated seats, the um, electronic windows. Like, I have to tell my kids and remind them that we used to crank our windows up. We didn't have little seat warmers on our tushies in the wintertime in Minnesota. In fact, you just like threw an extra blanket in the car or toughed it out. Uh, You know, I grew up in an era where we did not have a garage. We were uh, in the inner city and we lived in an apartment complex. And so you'd have to brush off the snow and put on your parka and get in that car, man, there were no heated seats. So You know, I want to to talk about, I I digress, right? That that happens sometimes, but the supply chain is very real. And I want to relate that back to you as a larger economic piece, right? Supply and demand. 
right? Supply and demand. What does that mean, Shannon? Well, when you want to purchase a product, let's say a car, and there is a lot of demand for cars, that price is going to go up because it's so popular. And they can because there's a limited amount of supply and people willing to pay that price. So supply and demand has definitely been impacted. That also creates rising costs of the things that we want to be able to buy. That means that some of these things aren't able to be accessible to some people that might need them. If cars are atrociously priced and you need a vehicle and there are no used cars available, that might mean your access is limited to something that maybe doesn't provide you the needs that you are so anticipating having. I think a lot of times people get worried about this increase of cost. We call it the word inflation. So inflation is when the price of those goods, the things that we want, goes up. We have lived in an environment, as long as I've been in the financial industry, in all honesty, that has had very low inflation. And inflation is directly correlated to interest rates and the cost of goods and all of these things are tied together like a big ball of yarn. And when you start to unwind one, it affects another, gets taught not not taught in things and uh, uh, that big ball of yarn that you had at your grandma's house that you're trying to get out um, and throw to the next person that doesn't always happen in a way that's so smooth when we start to talk about all of these financial things that are tied together so we look at it from an aspect of okay well now do you remember what a bottle of coca-cola cost in 1990 versus what it costs now. I remember going and Jim was playing a, a broom ball tournament and the girls wanted something to drink and there weren't concessions, but there were vending machines. And I remember looking and a 20 ounce bottle of Coca-Cola was like $2 and 25 cents. And I remember when it was a dollar 25, I remember when it's 50 cents. I remember when it, you know, like all of these varying different prices. Well, again, some of those costs and prices that we pay are directly impacted by the growth or the popularity sometimes of these items, the things that we need. What is that? What goes into that cost? Well, then we start to dig into, you know, how accessible is something that they need? And that goes back to impacts of COVID. When we had to shut down, there were elements in those goods that are being made or not even in our goods, in our produce and farmers having to not be able to have as many people on staff to be able to, you know, pick the corn or pick the soybeans or whatever it might be. We see drastic prices increasing even just our food alone. So it's not just your cars or your vehicles it's other things. We also see increases in the prices of our homes and how are we going to be impacted as they go forward? I, I often get asked, like, is there a housing bubble like 20, you know, 2008, Shannon? Like, is there going to like, should I buy a house right now? The reality is what happened in 2008 is very different than the situation that we are in right now from a housing perspective. We have, um, and I'm going to try to kind of like not water this down, but simplify it a little bit. We have a generation that is now moving into homeownership, a generation who was strapped with student loan debt when they graduated and continued to be strapped with student loan debt as they graduate and wanting to be more financially responsible and pay down that debt before they occurred another debt. I'm referring to that lovely generation that I happen to be a part of, although I am a, I am on the early cusp of millennials. Um, 
millennials have just now started to step into that element of home ownership. They have made many decisions not to, and I'm talking about a group or a generation in a grand scheme of things. We know that generations have different people who fall into different lines. And this is just an overarching theme for a group of people, not specifically just one person, but millennials have had the tendency from a home to push off home ownership, to look at paying down those student debts, to being able to look at what are the things that are important to them. And some of them loved being able to live in the city and have walkability to be able to go to the things that they wanted to. And now maybe some of them are transitioning into wanting to build that family. And so they are looking for that home. And so again, that supply and demand, or as I like to sometimes simplify it into popularity of home ownership. We also have um, the baby boomer generation who isn't quite ready to sell their home and move into maybe a different downsize to a different home. So we have these generations that are crossing. And so we see these rising prices in our homes begin because of that demand aspect of things. So some of these things are very much tied together. Now we've seen those rising costs of our real estate not necessarily due to COVID, but we have seen some popularity in other spaces within um, our country due to the effects of COVID. I, I just got off the phone with my auntie who lives up in the Duluth Superior area, and she was buying a home and looking for a home in Duluth, but so many people from the cities realized because of remote working right? A, a lot of times we had this exodus from rural America into the cities because that was the only place they could quote unquote get a job. And now we have this element of reversal. Many people who are interested in moving to a space where they can find more affordable housing and have the flexibility now from work that they can work wherever they want to. They got really creative because of COVID or now they are allowed to be able to work for a company that's in Seattle, but live in Duluth, Minnesota and have a better cost of living and be able to be wherever it might be for them that is where they want to start their family or experience their life. So we've seen some of this occur and I hope actually it helps some of our rural towns and smaller towns and not big cities thrive again as we experience this shift in housing as well. I think we've got to look at it from a perspective of impact, though, in affordable housing as well. We have seen those demands rise so frequently. And here in the Twin Cities, there were just two votes passed, um, both in Minneapolis and St. Paul, to impact those pricing of rentals and being able to um, get them lower. I think that it is important for us to look at the gap in between that though. I don't think that affordable housing should also always just assume a rental property, but also what are those elements of housing that could be built in a different capacity, town home, home ownership? What's that step into home ownership? Because that does lead to wealth as we create that large asset for ourselves. Uh, that being said, uh, this, this element of supply and demand has so many effects to us in our personal realm, but it's affected by other places and other things that are going on. So I want you to understand what those things are. And as we kind of switch gears from that inflationary conversation and supply chain, there's another element that is a constant conversation financially, and that is taxes. So we have some huge bills that are on Capitol Hill. Oh, wow. That we can be back to like my days in grade school. Wasn't there a little song or a little tune of a bill on Capitol Hill? Anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, maybe you're singing that along too, as I talk about that, but there are some things that are happening uh, in Washington, DC around you know, our infrastructure bill and federal spending and, you know, health care and different things that are on the docket. And not to make this political at all, because this is actually just making it simple. When we spend more money, we're likely going to have to pay that money back because we have a huge deficit as a country. 
and um, a deficit from 2008 that we haven't paid off. That being said, this deficit has helped to fund individuals to move forward. And I think that we can all agree that we do want to be able to help the people who need that help. And how do we establish the behaviors to get people moving in the direction that supports them and creates an element for them to thrive forward? No pun intended, but every pun intended. That being said, taxes do impact a lot of us. And many times, especially at the end of the year, I get questions of, Shannon, how can I save more in taxes? Am I being as strategic as possible? Here's the deal, friend. I am not your tax advisor. It is very important that you have a trusted individual in your life that you make sure that understands you and your financial picture and can help you answer some of those questions. But I do want to talk in big picture, what are some of those things that should be important to you to consider? No, as we go forward, I think we are probably at the lowest tax rates we will ever see because of the deficits that we have. The more spending that we have, likely the way that we will pay that back is through taxes. And so, you know, that that to say we do need some of these things and taxes can be paid in a responsible fashion and you can be able to be strategic about it. There is nothing wrong with you taking upon strategy in your life um, in every aspect of the words, but specifically as we talk about taxes today, thinking about it from an element. I, I talk about this a lot in financial planning. A, your accountant is always going to want to get you to the lowest income level possible. So making contributions to 401ks, deductible IRAs, donations, things like that. I want you to focus specifically on the 401k and deductible IRAs. You are going to have to pay taxes on those someday. They are not bad. You should be contributing to those types of vehicles for your wealth. However, how much are you putting in those vehicles to then make your tax liability down the road potentially more if we're in a rising element of taxes. Again, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what the tax rate will be when you're in retirement, but I sure hope for you that it's less than what you're paying right now as an individual because your income will be likely less because you're not on a payroll or paying yourself that same paycheck. Instead, you're taking upon strategy for yourself. I often refer to this as choice of retirement income. What buckets are you choosing to be able to save into? If you are putting everything into a bucket that you have to pay taxes on later, that might not be the best space for you. The other piece to consider is, um, and the other, the, the second bucket I talk about is tax deferred or tax free, excuse me, I talked about tax deferred, tax free. The next bucket is tax free. So that tax free bucket, um, some of the things that we think about as contributions in that area, Roth IRAs are the most common space. Um, and sometimes life insurance can be used in that space as well. That being said, Roth IRAs are not accessible to everyone. And there are some changes that are coming up from a tax aspect of things. Are Roth IRAs always going to be there? I would assume they will, but I don't know. I don't write the laws, friends. Um, are you always going to be able to contribute to them? Are you going to be able to do what are called Roth conversions or some people refer to them as backdoor Roth IRAs? Um, not everybody will be able to contribute to those in the future if some of these bills go into play. Some of it might be limited based on your income levels. And so being strategic about how you build that tax-free now and take advantage of the spaces that you are allowed to contribute. Do you have an old 401k that you haven't rolled over yet that you could potentially, based on your tax situation, convert into a Roth IRA? Again, as you start to you know, ask these questions of your team. I call them your personal board of directors. It's important that you bring together your financial advisor and your tax professional to be able to have those types of conversations and understand your impact, not only what's affecting you today, but in the future. So financially, some of the laws that are affected 
and put into place on Capitol Hill will affect us based on our own personal financial planning. And what's accessible to you now might not be in the future. So are you maximizing those opportunities for yourself? I think too, to consider some of those elements in that third bucket of taxable. How are you building those three options for yourself? Um, tax deferred in you know, your employer sponsored plans and deductible IRAs, that tax free in Roth. And then as we transition into taxable, we think about that as potentially uh, your pension income, your social security income, and any capital gains or other dividend income that you might be receiving as well. Uh, taxable is kind of a, a, an element that we talk about that's pay as you go, um, with the exception of, of social security and your pension. So you're looking at it as an element that you're paying taxes on now, but will potentially limit that going forward. The capital gains taxes could increase depending on what gets voted on again in Capitol Hill. We are seeing a lower element of capital gains. And if you are in a certain tax bracket, you potentially don't even have capital gains taxes that you would have to pay. Now, that being said, there are plenty of different calculations in there that you have to consider yourself. And so I challenge you to make sure that again, you're having those conversations. As I put a bow on today's episode, I want you to understand basically that everything that happens in this big picture can try kind of trickle into a way of affecting you in your life. And so how are you keeping yourself up to date and educated on the things that are happening without taking a nap because maybe finances aren't your jam and you don't want to fall asleep, but you want to be empowered in different situations that are happening. I love different resources and being able to scan things. I think our brain is a great space for us to expand on that knowledge. You might not understand everything that you read, but it's a way for you to continue to use this great muscle that your brain is and expand it and make it stronger. So even if you just download one of those great financial um, organization apps, some, you know, on my phone, I utilize Bloomberg, CNBC. I look at things from a global aspect sometimes too. Again, media can sway things and they can really target things in a way that makes you fearful from a financial standpoint. That's why I think partnering with a financial advisor, a uh, financial planner, wealth advisor, allows you a partner who can kind of simplify things and let you know how you personally will be affected by these things. Because some of the things that I talked about today, from the impacts of COVID-19 to supply chain, inflation and taxes, might not actually have that big of an impact on you in your personal financial planning aspect of things depending on what your situation looks like. So of course, as I always say, financial planning is so personal, my friend, as much as your DNA. So don't sit back, make sure that you're taking that opportunity. If you are looking for a partner to join you in 2022 as your financial wellness partner, well, we'd love to come alongside you. You can easily go to our website at forethoughtplanning.com backslash wealth assessment and schedule some time with our team today. So as we unloaded some complex topics today, um, please take the time to always remember you are worthy of wealth.